But before we get on the river, I want to share a devotion with you. I was asked early in the trip, you know, how do you, how do you deal with a geologist, for example, or a, an academic who says they're a Christian uh, and believes in an old earth? How do, how do you deal with them? Well, what I recommend is you don't go to Genesis chapter 1. I recommend you go to John chapter 1, the Gospel of John. Because you see, if they claim to be Christians, they're claiming to be followers of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we need to challenge them with the question, who is Jesus Christ? because the answer to that question makes all the difference. So you remember what uh, John starts his, his uh, gospel with? In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word, the Logos, was with God, and the Word, Logos, was with God. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him Nothing was made that was made. Notice I put the emphasis on the Logos, the Word. Jesus is the Word. What do we read in Genesis chapter 1? God spoke by his Word. All things were created. God spoke and it was so. It happened just as God spoke it. Jesus was there, the Word, as the agent of creation. Nothing was made that uh, without him making it. We also read in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, the writer of the Hebrews begins his epistle with these words. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken the word by his son, the Logos, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through him also he created the world. So it's very clear in John chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1 that Jesus was and is the creator himself. He created everything in John chapter 1 verse 3. And Paul reminds us of that in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And of course, the, Paul goes on to say in Colossians that by him all things consist or are held together. You know, the, the very atoms are held to, together by Jesus Christ. The fact that we have life and breath is because Jesus is in control of all things. Yep. Do you want to? Okay. So, what happened when Jesus came to this earth? We read in John chapter 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Of course, John there is referring to when they did see Jesus in all his glory. When was that? On the Mount of Transfiguration. And they could testify that Jesus never ceased to be the creator while he was here on the earth. We don't understand how he could be both fully human and fully God. He veiled his glory when he took on human flesh, but we know he never ceased to be the creator. Why? because he demonstrated his power as the creator while in his human flesh by the miracles that he did, by the miracles he did. And uh, 
we know he never ceased to be the creator because he said in John chapter 5, 36 and John 10, 37, 38, for the Father is in me, is in me, and I am in the Father. And he also said, I and my Father are one. <coughs> so he never ceased to be the creator. And how did he demonstrate that power? Well, first of all, he demonstrated that he had power over nature. We read in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27, you'll remember he sent the disciples ahead of him after a hard day's work and he, he stopped by on the... Uh, sorry, he, 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 sorry, he got in the boat and he fell asleep. And a raging storm came up. And, uh, you know, Peter, Andrew, James and John were hardened fishermen. They knew the Sea of Galilee. So it had to be a really bad storm for them to wake up Jesus and say, Master, we're going to perish. And so what was Jesus' response? He stood up in the boat and with a word, instantly, there was a great car. <coughs> it didn't take thousands or millions of years. Jesus spoke and instantly there was a great calm. Now, if Jesus, well, what was, what was the disciples' response? Ho-hum? No, we read they fell on their faces and worshipped him. They said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Of course they had to obey him because he created them. And friends, if Jesus could do that on the Sea of Galilee, What's the difference between Jesus saying, storm be still, and instantly it was still, and let there be light, and immediately there was light? What's the difference? You see, there's, that's a challenge for our old earth Christian brothers and sisters. If Jesus could do that in front of witnesses on the Sea of Galilee, what's the problem in Genesis chapter 1? The problem is what the secular scientists are saying, not what God's word is saying. We also read on another occasion that he sent the disciples ahead in the boat and he stayed on the shore to pray. And uh, what do we read? He came walking to them across the water, not the sandbar, across the water. We know, we know it was water, because when Peter tried it and took his eyes off Jesus, he sank. So, you know, all this, all this nonsense from the liberals about it being a sandbar is, is utterly rubbish based on the text of Scripture. How could Jesus walk on water when you and I, if we tried to, would sink? Well, Jesus created gravity. And so he can defy gravity if he chooses to because he's the creator. So he demonstrated he had power over nature. He also had demonstrated his power to create. In John chapter 2, I've already referred to this, his first miracle was at the marriage feast of Cana. And they ran out of wine. And what did he do? He told the servants to fill the water pots and the water instantly became wine. We all know that water is hydrogen and oxygen wine is a complex organic molecule so it was a miracle of creation and it was done in front of eyewitnesses and it was done instantly there's no deception on god's part or jesus part we'll come back to that in a moment and then in matthew 14 and 15 we read on two occasions where jesus fed 5,000 and 4,000 men plus women and children and in one of those instances he took a little boy's lunch, uh, five loaves and two fishes, and what did he do? He broke it, he broke it, he broke it, and broke it, and broke it. Before their very eyes, he created more bread, more fish, more bread, more fish. And they fed all those people, and they gathered up 12 basketfuls of scraps left over. A miracle of creation. Again, Jesus did that in front of his disciples. That's why John could, could say that we, we saw we saw with our own eyes that he was the creator. And so again, the challenge to our old earth brothers and sisters, do they really believe those miracles that Jesus has the creator in front of eyewitnesses 
could create instantly more bread, more fish. And then Jesus had power over life itself. We read in uh, John chapter 9 that he healed a man born blind. And it's repeated and it's emphasised there in the record. What's the significance about a man born blind? Well, a man born blind had never seen another person, never seen a tree, never seen an animal. And yet, when Jesus... So, you know, when we're born, we learn by seeing things and associating names with things. This man had never had that. But when Jesus healed his eyes, he also healed his brain because he was able to recognise what he saw. And only the creator of human eyes and human brains would have the power to do that. And of course, we know that on several occasions, he raised, for example, Jairus' daughter from the dead. You know, you know don't, don't bother, Master, he, she's, already, she's already died. He said, no, no, she's only asleep. She went, he went and took her by the hand and raised her back to life again. And to emphasize the miracle, remember when Lazarus died, Jesus deliberately, deliberately delayed going to Bethany. And when he arrived, they said, Oh, Master, it's, his body stinks, you know, he's already dead. It's, so Jesus wanted to make sure everybody knew that Lazarus was really, really, really dead. And what did he do? He told them to take the stone away and he called Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came walking back to life. Only the creator of life could bring people back from the dead. Oh, by the way, what was the response of the Jewish leaders? They wanted to get rid of the evidence. They wanted to kill Lazarus. Has anything changed today? They don't want to know the evidence. And Jesus also demonstrated his power over demons. He didn't have only have power over the physical creation. He had power over the angelic realms. He had power over the demons. He had power over Satan. And he cast out demons. Several instances, such in Luke chapter 4. So, if Jesus is and was the creator and demonstrated his power as the creator by his miracles, then everything he said had to be the truth. In fact, we're reminded in John 14, verses 5 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No, man comes to the fa no one comes to the Father except through me. If Jesus ever told a lie, he cannot be the way and he cannot be the life. We may as well go home and be miserable like everybody else. This is serious because our old earth brothers and sisters in Christ are accusing Jesus of lying. Why? Well, we'll come to that in a minute. Jesus also said in John 14, he said, the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells me in me and does his works. In John 3 verse 12, Jesus said, if, you don't, if I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He was speaking of Nicodemus. And four verses later, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Four verses earlier, he said, if you don't believe the earthly things I tell you, how are you gonna believe the heavenly things I tell you? And then in John 5, verses 45 and 47, through 47, you know, he was talking to the Jewish leaders who prided themselves on their knowledge of scripture. And Jesus was actually being sarcastic when he spoke to them. He said, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? What writings were, did Moses write? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses was the vehicle the Holy Spirit used to write down Genesis 1 through 11. And Jesus said, if you don't believe what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe my words? And you know, it's true. 
It's very true. Even our old earth brothers and sisters in Christ don't believe Moses and they don't believe Jesus' words. Why do I say that? Well, what earthly things did Jesus tell us? The one who is the truth. In Mark 13, verse 19, Jesus spoke of the creation that God created. So Jesus taught that God created all things. If Jesus taught that, then you and I should believe that. In uh, Matthew 10, sorry, Mark 10, 6, and Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6, Jesus spoke, said, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female, not he, them, it, I, etc. He made only a man and a woman, male and female. End of story. That's our authority. Not only Moses, but Jesus reiterated. In fact, Jesus was saying he was being asked a question about divorce. And so he taught them about marriage. Where did marriage begin? In the beginning, when God made man and woman. That was the first. And he goes on, not only to quote Genesis chapter 1, but Genesis chapter 2. He said, God made them man and woman. Therefore, a man shall leave his father, mother, and cleave with his wife, and they shall be one flesh. He was quoting Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 in the same context, indicating that there's no, there's no, uh, they're complementary chapters, they're not in conflict with one another. And notice Jesus said, in the beginning, from the beginning, God made man and woman, not after billions of years of cosmic, geologic, and biological evolution. The beginning was the creation week. The earth was only created five days before man. That's back at the beginning. So if Jesus taught that, then you and I should believe that. And Jesus referred in Matthew 25, 3 and Luke 11, he referred to Adam's son Abel as a literal historical person. And in Matthew 24 and Luke 17, Jesus spoke of the days of Noah. He spoke of Noah entered the ark and the flood came and took them all away. Not some, all away. Okay, so if Jesus spoke of Noah and the ark and the flood as a real historical event with real people who perished, then you and I should believe that too because he's the, way, he's the truth, the way and the life. And notice the context in Luke 17 and Luke 24. The disciples had asked Jesus about the signs of his second coming. And he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming day of the Son of Man. Do you and I believe that Jesus will come globally? Well, he was comparing his second coming to the flood. The flood had to be also global. And Peter, who heard those words in his second epistle, chapter 3, when he referred to the scoffers, he said the scoffers will deny the evidence for creation, they will deny the evidence for the flood, and they will scoff at the second coming. If creation is global, the second coming is global, then by comparison, Peter's saying the flood is global. The world that then existed perished. The heavens and the earth which are now, see, Peter made a clear distinction that the flood was a dividing line between the old world that perished and the world that we live in now that's preserved until the day of the coming judgment. So, if Jesus taught those things and spoke those things, then if he is the truth, then you and I should believe those things. Now, I want to go back to that marriage feast that at Cana in John chapter 2 because we can draw out a few lessons there because Jesus' power and word outrank man's finite fallible reasoning you know we sometimes get puffed up with our knowledge but our knowledge is a drop in the bucket compared to what God knows now what happened at the marriage feast well as I said before Jesus instantly turned water into wine. He, uh, he told the servants to fill up the water jugs and 
to draw out from those water jugs and it was already wine. They saw the miracle and Jesus sent the servants to the master of the feast to let him taste the wine. And what did the master of the feast do? He asked the bridegroom, he said to the bridegroom, now most people bring out the best wine and when everyone's had their full, they serve up the rubbish. But you have kept the best wine to last. So we know that Jesus had created mature wine ready to drink that instantly was there to meet a need. But you see, the master of the feast deceived himself because he looked at the taste of that wine and thought that it was wine that had come from grapes grown on vines that had been harvested, had been crushed and had taken years to mature. But he was wrong. He didn't talk to the eyewitnesses. He asked the bridegroom instead of talking to the servants who saw the miracle. He used his finite human reasoning and he got the wrong answer. He didn't ask the eyewitnesses. Did Jesus deceive anyone? You see, people say to you and I, and our old earth brothers and sisters in Christ say that, and I emphasize in Christ, they're our, they are our Christian brothers and sisters. They look at the world and say, oh, it looks old, therefore God has deceived us. No, he hasn't. He's given us an eyewitness testimony. He provided the eyewitnesses for the, for the, for the master of the feast, the servants, and instead the master of the feast chose to use his own human reasoning and his pride. Why did he want to talk to the servants? Ugh. No, he asked the bridegroom. He made the mistake by using his own human reasoning. And don't forget what I said the other day. Why did Jesus create that fully mature wine? Well, it's just the same in Genesis chapter 1. He didn't create seedlings that had to spend years growing before it, they produced fruit, trees with fruit on. Otherwise, Adam and Eve would have starved three days later. He created fully mature trees with fruit on them, ready for Adam and Eve to eat. And he demonstrates here in this miracle that, that that's his modus operandi in creation. He created stars with the light already here because they were to be for signs and for seasons. And he created everything fully formed, fully functioning, mature. I hate the, I hate the expression appearance of age. Why? Because we put the, we put the age on the rocks. We, the, we, the rocks don't have labels on them saying hi, I'm millions of years old. The, the scientists have attached those labels and they've attached those labels without referring to the eyewitness account. They've used their human reasoning to argue for the millions of years instead of submitting to the authority of God's word. And so we need to, we need to recognize the limits of our knowledge and recognize that Jesus's power and word outrank all our wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Remember what Job, when God spoke to, to Job out of the whirlwind, after they'd had this long conversation, Job with his colleagues, his, his so-called friends, and you know, Job didn't lose his faith, but he was, so, he was so confused. How did God treat Job? God said to Job, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. And so God says to Job, do you know this? Do you know that? Do you know this? Do you know that? Do you know this? And what was Job's response at the end? In Job chapter 42, he came to the realisation, I know you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? 
Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. You see, we need to recognise that our knowledge is a drop in the bucket compared to God's knowledge. And we need to maintain a humility when we come to the evidence in this world around us. The prophet Isaiah says in 45, chapter 45, verse 9, Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. Does the clay say to him who forms him, what are you making? You see, the, the, the potter has the, has the power to form the clay however he wants to. And the clay has no right to question the potter. Well, finally, and most importantly and crucially, I believe that Jesus derives his power as the saviour because he is the creator. The very gospel itself depends, the power of the gospel depends on Jesus being the creator. Now, I'm not saying that you have to believe in creation to be a Christian. We know that because Paul, sorry, Luke says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for as there is none other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And what is the basis, Paul says in Romans 10, verse 9? Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It doesn't say there you have to believe in Genesis 1 to 11 to be saved. But see, who is Jesus Christ? How can he possibly save us? We read in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. And Paul in Rome, in Colossians, sorry, Corinthians chapter 15 says, For as by man came death, by man also came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, a real literal man, all died, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Why did God go to the bother of putting those genealogies in Genesis chapter 5 and Genesis chapter 10? The answer is in Matthew and Luke. Because what were they doing? They were tracing his lineage back to Adam. And that's why Paul could say that the last Adam is Jesus Christ because the first Adam was a real man. It's his story from beginning to end, by the way. Because Jesus' lineage, his family lineage, can be traced back to Adam, he can truly be our kinsman redeemer. If Adam wasn't a real man, then what does that do, not only the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 10, but also to the genealogies in Matthew and Luke? You see, we have to be very careful how we handle Scripture. But I want you to think about it. The power of the gospel depends on the power of Jesus as the Creator. As the creator, he had infinite power. Think about it. For God so loved the world. The creator himself came to die for each one of us. We're not just an insignificant speck of dirt. You know, what manner of man is this that the creator of the universe came to die for each one of us? That's how much God loves us. That's how much each one of us is significant to God. Doesn't that, doesn't that humble you? Doesn't that blow your mind? What a demonstration of love that, that Jesus could come to die for each one of us. And he could do that only because he's the creator. And how do I know that all our sins were nailed to the cross? 
because the infinite creator had power to die for everyone for all their sins throughout all time and every place. That's how we know all our sins were nailed to that tree. If he isn't the creator, then we're dead in our set trespasses and sin without any hope. Only the creator had the power to die for all people in all time, through all places, all sin. But it doesn't end there. The good news is that because he's the creator, not only did he have the power to lay down his life, he had the power to take up his life and rise from the dead. And because he lives, it's our guarantee that we will live also. Isn't that incredibly good news? It really is. And the significance of it is because he is the creator. The creator. And that's why I emphasize that the power of the gospel depends on the power of Jesus as the creator. And so the challenge this morning is, do we really believe that Jesus is the creator? I know everyone in this circle does. But, you know, it saddens me when I think of our young earth, uh, our old earth Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. Because, you know, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that one day we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that one may receive what is due for what is done in the body, whether good or evil. You know, I take very seriously what I say and what I teach. Why? Because one day I'm going to have to stand before Jesus and give an account of everything that I've done and everything that I've said. And what did Jesus say? He who leads even the least of these little ones astray, it's better a millstone be put around his neck and be cast into the sea. It's really serious business. And it really breaks my heart when I see Bible scholars, scientists who say they're Christians and don't believe Genesis 1 through 11. What are they going to say to Jesus Christ on Judgment Day? He'll say to them, you had my word, why didn't you believe? What excuses are they going to give? Well, well, the majority of scientists said this. No, 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 no. What did my word say? Remember what Jesus said? Truth is not determined by majority vote. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. Don't ever be overwhelmed by the majority. We're called to live and take the narrow way, trusting God's word from the very first verse. We shouldn't be putting our faith in the words of finite, fallible man. God's word is our authority. We can stake our life on God's word because Jesus himself demonstrated that he was and is the creator. Jesus deliberately made sure that there were hundreds of witnesses to his resurrected body. You know, and it's exciting. Because remember what Jesus said to his disciples when he ate with them in his resurrected body? A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like you see me have. We'll have a physical resurrected body. It's exciting. That's our destiny. So friends, if we really, really believe the things that we've been learning, then it affects the way we live. It changes our lives, it affects the way we live, and it also affects the way that we pray. Because if he's the creator, he can choose to do for us whatever he chooses to do. We can go to our heavenly father knowing that if we ask for bread, he won't give us a stone. If we ask for fish, he won't give us a serpent. And consider the lilies. We've seen these flowers. In a few weeks, they'll be gone. But our Heavenly Father takes care of us just as he takes care of the birds and the, and, the, and the flowers. And so 
our Heavenly Father is the one that created all things. So, my friends, let's remember that God's word is true from the very beginning. And let's go out of this, the canyon with a renewed vision, a renewed inner, inner strength that we're going to stand by God's word no matter what. No matter what the world throws at us, we can be confident in God's word from beginning to end. Because this week we've seen the evidence in God's world is consistent with what we read in God's word. We didn't start with the evidence. Sadly, many of our old earth Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ start with the evidence and then impose that on God's word. No, we start with God's word and use God's word as the authority to understand the evidence in the world around us. And we don't, we don't, yes, there's lots of questions that we still have, but we have sufficient. God has given us sufficient. One of my friends used to say, you know, if it was that obvious that everything was created and obvious that, that, that the flood caused it all, we wouldn't have to exercise faith. It's by faith, ultimately, that we understand these things. But it's not a blind faith. God has left his testimony in the world around us so that when we look at what he's made, we can, we're without excuse and we can look at the evidence for the flood in this canyon and we have no excuse. So I trust that that's been an encouragement and a, and a challenge to you this morning. It's a challenge to me and I love, like to be reminded of itself, myself as well. I'm just the same as you. I'm an earthen vessel, flawed like everyone else. But we can look to our Heavenly Father and draw strength that He's the one by His indwelling Spirit that helps us day by day to keep our trust in Him and His works all around that are on display all around us. Well, let's have a word of prayer before we venture on our day together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is truth. We thank you that you're the awesome, all-powerful creator who has revealed yourself through your son, Jesus Christ, the one who created all things, the one who was weary, like we get weary, the one who suffered, like we suffer. And yet, Father, we thank you that he didn't sin, that he was the perfect sacrifice for our sins, demonstrating your love on the cross when he died for us. And because he was the creator, he had the power to rise from the dead so that we have hope in him, knowing that we have a, a destiny that was created before the foundation of the world, eternity with you. We look forward to that day. We groan in these earthly flawed vessels and we look forward to that day. May we be clothed in Christ's righteousness so that we can stand before you perfect in him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we can do this morning is to pause as we begin this new day to worship you and to be humble before you. And yet, Father, we know that you're a, a good father you delight to do good things. Thank you already for the care and protection that we've seen on this trip. We've seen mishaps, and yet, Father, you've got us through. We've seen wild rapids, but you've got us through. You've provided for our, all our physical needs, and so, Father, we thank you that we can trust you to our journey's end, not only in the canyon, but in life. Whether you come again or you call us home, we can be confident in you. So thank you. We commit our day to you. Thank you for our crew. Give them wisdom today in the rapids. And we pray that you would bless our day together. Thank you, Father, for the love that we share as brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we pray for those we know who don't know you, family, friends, even brothers and sisters in Christ, Father, who, who don't trust your word, we love them, help us to be 
gracious and loving to them and be patient with them, knowing that it's only the Holy Spirit that will convince and convict them. May we be fit vessels for your service, not only this day, but in the days of come, to come, that the light of the glorious gospel would shine through us, that we light set on a hill that will, the Holy Spirit will use to draw men and women to him. So thank you. We commit our way to you. Bless us this day, we pray. And we pray all this in the name of our blessed Lord and Saviour, to whom all glory, majesty and power belongs. Amen.